So this is my second time visiting uh, Broadway International University. I was here 12 years ago, so almost a generation ago. I don't remember this room, but it's a beautiful building. I visit a few faculty members. I know some of them are here today. Um, the second small fact is this is the you know, first time I came out for in-person seminar after two years. My previous one was right before pandemic in Michigan. So <laughs> it's a great enjoyment that I really I really love to see you know, the audience here, especially second time visit FIU. I've seen the departments growing with new faces under new leadership. So that's great. So I believe I have about an hour, but I talked to a colleague here. I actually have 45 minutes. So I will try to keep it a brief. And this is a great research day. I know they have fantastic research across the campus will be presented today. So I want to talk to you about some of the research, my own lab, my own passion day about, which is on the small scale devices, which I name as a microchips in translational medicine. So it's a really broad topic. I hope I can cover a few highlights in a way of you know, entertain you about what the small scale device engineering system can do to help advance healthcare. So I'll talk about the microchip for cancer diagnostics for uh, another initiative which I personally feel very excited about is the energy issue in healthcare. So there are many humble devices based on battery. So how the small system can play a role, make it sustainable. And if I have time, we'll touch a little bit on wearable devices, but I know we have active group here working on active devices. So let's get started. When we talk about biology medicine, you know, I'm an engineer and we have the environment of combining engineering and advancement to solve healthcare problem. And I want to touch on the notion on miniaturization, integration, and then automation, right? So this notion is not new to us because we have seen that over the past few decades in terms of handle you know, using this integration, automation, miniaturization, how that revolutionized information industry. So back in the 50s, we know it's transistor, bigger scale, all the way uh, through the semiconductor revolution and then the clean room, and then other fantastic discography, fabrication techniques. Now we have these portable devices which can handle computation, communication, and then you name it. We our life depend upon the small gadgets. We cannot live without it, right? So the question is, can we do the same for chemistry, biology, and the medicine? So if you look at most fundamental level, it's also about information transfer, right? Between the cells, among the cells, transfer <coughs> information through DNA, simply assays, and then we can do, you know, organ regeneration, tissue engineering, and all the fantastic research. So it, it has to be already happening over the past few centuries. If you look over the first invention of microscope that enabled cell biologists to look at a cell, small units of biology, not from artistic point of view, but really from scientific point of view. And fast forwarding to nowadays, we have DNA microarrays, and we have various type of way to do you know, genome sequencing. We have new initiative under different administration, right, for the um, uh, uh, a few years ago on the Human Brain Project, um, uh, potential moonshots, excuse me for forwarding here. So I was talking about we can do, draw parallelism between the um, engineering effort to revolutionize information theory, uh, information industry, to do the same for biology and then the medicine, where we have a few big initiatives for the brain, Human Brain Project, the last administration on the opioid epidemics and also on the cancer moonshot, you know, creating the new initiative to help early diagnosis of cancer and provide effective therapy. So along those lines, I want to highlight the human genome project, right? And this chart is from uh, NIH and HGRI, which compare the Moore's law, which is, you know, well known for semiconductor industry. Uh, you have a different way to describe it, you know, density by circuits is double every, you know, couple years, or the size decreased by a factor squared of two. And compare that more slower to um, the trend where the cost for whole genome sequencing has been increasing from a large number since 2000, all the way down to about a thousand dollars before the pandemic. And the most recent number is for sequencing of a whole human genome, one person is down below $500, right? So if you consider that accelerated advancement of that new technology, to help on whole genome sequencing. Once we have that data points, you know, below a hundred dollar, a couple hundred dollar whole genome sequencing, that will change the landscape of medicine. You know, in that way, it becomes more preventive and more targeted therapy. So we clearly see the trend here 
of using advanced engineering technology to help um, uh, healthcare and in the medicine. I don't think it's moving here. Okay, great. So the vision is really I come up with this, you know, benchmark is um, we look into the engineering foundations of engineering micro nano scale, which involve borrowing the integrated circuit technology, make a smaller medical devices. And then new functional materials, right? We talk about the various type of nano functional materials, nanoparticles, nano rods, nano spheres. We can see nanoparticle has been playing a role for drug delivery for uh, cancer biomarker detection. So intersection of those can provide a beneficial tool to look into the big challenges in medicine, all the way from genetic scale, cellular scale, uh, up to the uh, organ level. So over there, we have a notion of by applying this small scale system, we can come up with a new diagnostic method which address small volume, provide a point of care, a real time detection with the enhanced performance, including better sensitivity, better specificity, and then provide a better dynamic range, right? So this combination of different area providing a new exciting tool to solve this big problem in biology. And another goal will be for biological inspired engineering devices, right? So, so far we talk about soft robots. Uh, we even have, you know, bioengineers design cardiac cell driven soft robotic and, and soft actuators. So this is really a, a, a two way direction. You know, we have informed design for engineering from biological inspiration. We can also uh, uh, harvest the advancement in engineering design to better address healthcare uh, challenges. So for this audience, I think we don't need to talk too much about these fundamentals, but when we design these micro small devices, there are some terminologies here um, we use all the time. You know, MAMS is microelectromechanical systems. It's essentially broadening the idea of designing a small system, not only handle electrons, but handle you know, microflow, handle uh, photons, handle, handle other, um, uh, to, to study small scale physics and apply into device design. And the biomems is application of MEMS into biology. And then if you downscale by southern times, you see the nanotechnology and application for bio is bio nanotechnology. And I just show some of the graphics here, you know, that way you have a visual recognition of such systems, such technology. So this is a wafer, uh, it's a silicon wafer. And on surface of the wafer, it's patterned the pressure sensors. So you can consider each of the square as a one sensor or one die that you can cut them and make a sensor out of it. And this is microelectromechanical system. In the middle, on the top left, it's a small circle. It's actually a, a small mirror, which tune around uh, based on the two axes. Now the application for this mirror has been found in endoscopes. So you can design a very small endoscope so you can look into cavities, um, uh, for example, for application of cervical cancer screening or for the uh, oral cancer screening uh, based on you know, kind of focal imaging principles which look into abnormal uh, physiology of cell nuclei and cytoplasma cells. And here is one small video. If you click that, it was uh, a new device. And this is the function of that small scanner, which is, you know, read right a laser, laser a spot on a screen. So this creates a raster scan. If you combine with uh, specific program, programmable scanners, you will pr produce a confocal image. And this is the sample of the probe. Uh, we work together with Stanford sample this probe, which can provide, you know, uh, uh, intracardiovascular imaging. And we demonstrate both confocal imaging modalities and OCT uh, uh, imaging probe. For nano, uh, th this is another biomass uh, example where you have an array of, this is a cell assembly pads. We can modify the surface properties to make it hydrophobic and com combine it with self assembly techniques with this first embryo and cell on the surface that can provide a self assembly of the cells based on surface tension. Um, and this is a, another video, but we don't have to play it. I think it's the idea here is right, demonstrate the e efficiency of the self assembly pads when you direct a flow into the embryos. You know, you, can, you have to push into a, with a certain force to push it off the path. This is showing the efficiency for the cell sample. And we also have a various way to synthesize nanoparticles. So this is, you can see different morphology, uh, different morphology with uh, implied different binding efficiency when they coat, you know, the uh, 
antibody to recognize antigen-specific target cells. And this is a capture cancer cell, which I will target for a bit more in a few minutes uh, for cell recognition screening cancer biomarkers. So all these technology are based on silicon, right? Which is we can borrow a lot from the circuit industry, integrated circuit industry. But there are also another another class of material called the soft materials. This involves biological membranes, liquid crystals, polymers, membranes, uh, colloid and surfactants, and so forth. And Based on these soft materials, we can design some of the very interesting materials. Uh, for example, for PDMS, we know that it's a major material for contact lens. You know, it's a passive medical device. And we can also make various uh, structures into polymer like a PDMS. It's a pre-polymer. Yeah, it's a very uh, quick process to pattern into the pre-polymer through a process called the soft lithography. And this is a um, microfluidic channel. It's a fluid channel. Um, embedded, uh, implemented into the PDMS uh, using soft lithography, and we can also build polymer-based uh, flexible sensors. Right? So this is the one type of sensor uh, which we can wrap around the surface and measure the stress uh, along uh, 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 among the soft materials. So for the soft material, they have a unique property, uh, biology, and then they have combination of physics, chemistry, biology, or meat with engineering in that specific material, uh, which we can find various applications. I will just give a few. Um, in the recent time, uh, there are various design on using polymers. You know, the top figure is a mobile robots. It's a pneumatic uh, pressure-driven uh, robots. And then there are also design on the grippers, uh, which better fit in, you know, hands and then uh, can perform various, various functions and controls. And we also designed some of the interesting material uh, based on capacitive structures. There's an electrostatic uh, structure, which we can come up with a walking robots. And uh, here showing some of the uh, basic schematics, you know, we can design the gap, control the gap size, and when you apply the electrical field, it will generate uh, some of the motion. So this is a very short video, which is if you have two parallel plates, those are the polymers. If you form this gap of high electrical field, they can generate a motion working around. So we have seen that this is a quick introduction. On, you know, when you look at this, this space, it's really provide lots of opportunities. You have various materials uh, other than silicon, look into polymers, apply different physical chemistry principles, uh, you generate various physical systems and then generate many interesting devices. Now, I want to focus on the rest of this talk on two topics. One is apply such microfluidic system, right, made by PDMS to screening uh, tumor biomarkers. And then the second, second topic is more on the uh, physical system, um, the actuators for bioenergy harvesting. And it's, hopefully this two topic give a flavor of what type of application, you know, these small devices can be applied to. For the first topic, the circulating tumor biomarkers. The idea here is really create a, a, another way other than biopsy uh, and a regular pathology imaging to find out the cancer early, right? Because cancer is devastating in a way of many cases to find too late. Already the metastasis you know, migrate to other places. So the idea here is really based on the liquid biopsy, right? Liquid biopsy is if you take a human fluidic, you know, blood sample, saliva, urine, you know, uh, lymphofluidic, and if we can find any trace of biomarker there, hopefully that will provide an indicator much earlier than the imaging methodology and you know, regular biopsy as an indicator of likelihood there are existence of cancer. And then we can find uh, hopefully an early way to prevent or, or stop or slow down that progression. The biomarker we first, uh, when we begin with this project, the first biomarker we look at is the circulating tumor cell. I know this name may run bell to you because they are ongoing research since you know early 2000. There are many type of research on uh, identify CTCs, capture CTCs, and what we can do up to capture CTCs. Another biomarker we have done recently a lot is on the circulating nucleic acids. Right? The cdDNA is a subcellular component, nucleic acids. And if we can detect circulating DNA from blood samples, um, we can do genetic analysis of those and provide lots of uh, interesting information. A third one is circulating exosomes. You know, this is a, a biomarker which has some 
um, a controversial debate early on whether it's really meaningful or not. But it turns out there are some interesting uh, biomarker uh, containing exosome like uh, microRNA, which can be captured and analyzed. So I will run quickly about uh, some of the research we have done in this biomarker capture using micro devices. And then uh, you will see that after we uh, capture those very rare biomarkers, we can do lots of uh, follow on and, and downstream analysis. So for CTCs, it's a cell impact from primary tumor and circulate in the prostate. Right? You can think about, you know, primary tumor is one place, but going through that mechanism, the detached consensus cell can go into the circulation and secure another site. That exactly caused, you know, the problem, right? That someone um, hypothesized, if we understand the mechanism of how the cell detached from tumor cell at, at the primary tumor site, and, and going through circulation and find a new site that's secure there, that will provide a great insights about what's really going on for cancer metastasis. And the principle behind capture CDC um, is that you know different um, cancer type they have different uh, surface uh, antigen, and we need to design antibody to recognize those antigen uh, corresponding to different type of cancer, and that way provide uh, a convenient <coughs> way of capture. Or recognize those uh, cancer cells. So I list here there are a list of biomarkers corresponding to uh, main type of cancers. Like for example, HER2 is well known for the uh, breast and gastric cancer, and then EGFR is for breast collector and gastric and so forth. So these are the, uh, the list of biomarkers we learn from molecular biology. And the question is how to come up with tools to capture those. And the there was also a question about, well, if we capture those and number, whether that have any significance for clinicians. And the answer is yes, we do. And here you have you know, the numbers, um, every certain amount of blood samples, 7.5 mil, and that corresponding to number of CDCs corresponding to uh, the survival rate over a certain period of time. Also, the dynamic change in biomarker expression indicate the disease progression. Now, for industry, there are also tremendous interest uh, in a way of you know, Johnson Johnson, they have a very dark cell search system and they try to do using magnetic nanoparticles uh, in a big testing tube uh, under magnetic field to capture that particle labeled a uh, cell. And uh, based on this biomarker recognition, capture the cell on the place and then do fluorescent staining, uh, recognize the, the, uh, the CDCs versus the normal cell. Uh, there was a, a company from Europe. Uh, so this is a needle type approach where like, the patient sit in a clinic and putting the needle into the vein and then sitting there for 30 minutes, the assumption is all the blood going to circulate over that point after 30 minutes. So, so the tip of the needle going to enrich all the CDCs of the capture, right? And, and then you can do, you know, putting the needle into buffer solution and then release those cells and further analysis. And then this is the second generation of Veridex based on what I learned. And this is a collaboration between uh, a group in Harvard and then Johnson Johnson. They have an integrated microphony chip which integrate uh, three stages. Uh, one is for uh, removing the, the red blood cell and then do uh, hydrodynamic focusing and then do network screening and getting the CDCs. All this can be implemented into a CD disk. I don't know anyone here still remember the old days music CD. You know, it's a Forgotten industry, but you know it's I'm coming back in a in a way not for the music industry anymore, but really for the biotech industry. It's a way to make CD in a cheap and very high throughput manner, and uh, which is great news for medical devices, right? You make it feasible in manufacturing, make it scalable. All right, so very quickly, what we come up with is uh, the so-called immunomagnetic microfluidic screening system, and uh, we design the small wave magnets on the surface. And that way, uh, through immunomagnetic recognition, you still label the cell with magnetic particles, you know, conjugated with uh, antibody recognized antigen on the target cell. So antigen antibody binding, you capture those cell, and then through magnetic field, deposit on the surface with better distribution. And then there was a reason for that. You know, one is for numeration, another is for the single cell based analysis. So that shift can be done using multiple ways. We can do lithography or we can do inject printing, which can provide you know, uniform array of microchips. And um, this is a, a microchip uh, we can print on the regular glass slides and then making it uh, uh, make into the, uh, a holder and give the clinician. 
So that way they can capture the cell under, uh, and observe under a uh, microscope. And we come up with various prototypes. So this prototype is in the laboratory six channel uh, machine. And then this is a, a quick video. If you click over here, you will see that the operation of the six channel, uh, the micro footage chip is mounted here. And the rocking is to make a, the blood sample to be uh, not clogging over the time. And then the flip over is try to uh, get rid of those uh, uh, false uh, positive uh, capture, you know, because gravity will play a role to draw the uh, non-attached cell away from magnetic surface. And then later on, we uh, spin off a company called Nano uh, Light. So this is a machine with two channel system with user interface. And so they, this machine um, uh, was uh, acquired later by a pharma industry to do a very different uh, drug discovery purpose. But uh, from here to here, we uh, essentially uh, make the micro footage chip to be in the format of disposable and in a card holder, which clinically will be easy to open and close, and then replace the glass slides with the small features we paint on the surface. And the recognition, so for the capture, um, we're just using that uh, multi-channel uh, setup. For the recognition, there's a fluorescent uh, labeling. You know, this is and known as we can use, for example, the dipetal label, a nucleus, cytokaritin to label the uh, cell membrane, and CD45 is selective recognition. So through this uh, recognition, we'll be able to identify the CDC uh, in, in the blood samples. So we try it on both spike samples and the patient samples. We work with uh, UT uh, Southwestern a Medical Center uh, to, to accumulate over uh, hundreds of patients. And um, it's quite efficient uh, based on this fluorescent labeling combined with immunomagnetic you know, recognition. On the research front, uh, which I think is most uh, exciting to us, is what we can do after capture those CDCs. Because CDCs are rare, very few, and we don't want to just do numeration after capture, right? It turns out we can do lots of genetic analysis and single cell analysis based on what we capture. Um, and first, we can do the fish analysis. So this is a regular. Uh, laboratory technique uh, to recognize specific target gene around the chromosome. And here uh, we, we uh, analyze the breast cancer, breast cancer cells looking to the gene expression for uh, HER2 and step 17. And we try it, uh, we measure the, the uh, ratio number and then the copy number, and we try it on the different uh, cancer cell lines. And SKBR3, MDMD231, so there are two different cancer cell lines. One is uh, mostly HER2 positive, is not there, it's a HER2 negative. And we measure this copy number uh, uh, and then the original number between HER2 and uh, SEP17. And both spike samples and then the patient samples validate that this is a really meaningful analysis just based on few captured cells. And all these fish uh, results are strongly showing that, you know, if we have a way to capture CDC early, we do uh, uh, you know, small cell fish analysis, uh, these results will be quite meaningful for the informed clinician about uh, what type of uh, cancer uh, likely the uh, patient has. And we also try this on uh, the quantitative PCR analysis. Um, and here we combine immunomagnetic recognition, you know, using the microfluidic chip to capture the CDC. And what the difference is, we cover the microfluidic substrate using the pine field, which after capture the cells, can be laser using laser uh, dissection uh, microscope to pop up a cell into a tube and uh, to perform the single cell PCR. And these are the heat maps showing that uh, based on a thousand of cell and based on the few cells, we uh, tried using uh, nine different genes. You can see that we got pretty much a very informative results compared to thousand cell analysis of um, the different expression level. Uh, still for these three different types of uh, breast cancer uh, cell lines. Some of the re uh, recent results is we also analyze the cancer cell uh, metabolism because cancer cell need, need nutrition to grow, right? So if we understand the, for example, assumption rate of glucose in the microenvironment surrounding the cancer cell, we'll be better understand how the cell grow uh, over the time. Uh, so this is combined microfluidic capture of CDC with um, analysis using the laser desorption ionization mass spec to analyze the glucose concentration around the cell. So, a very interesting results. 
Um, this is in collaboration with uh, another group uh, doing the mass spec because we're not doing mass spec. And they're showing another power, uh, uh, powerfulness of combining the single cell capture or fuel cell capture with downstream uh, uh, mass spec of the metabolism of that small group of cells. <coughs> And another study following on that single cell capture is uh, a CTC capture is we call the optomagnetic attachment CTCs. And the idea here is we cover the microfluidic chip uh, using a gold layer. So it's a, a randomized pattern of the gold layer. And that generates interesting uh, phenomenon called the parsimonics when you have a squeezing effects of capture CVC under the magnetic force. So that provides additional benefits of if you have near field enhancement of that optical signal that provide a better detection. So this work is in collaboration with a chemistry group in Stanford that they, they have this randomized pattern to generate effective uh, plasmonics. And we have the microfluidic capture CDC, the combination of the two provide a better detection signal. Now, on top of the CTC uh, detection, we move later forward to capture the CTDNA. And we use um, a different design for microfluidic chip. So this is um, a group. We have a surface pattern for the microfluidic uh, surface. And uh, using the surface pattern, we align a array of uh, nanorods, right? And then we can conjugate the, uh, the, nano, the nanorods uh, using a specific sequence to recognize the target sequence of um, a cancer. Here is uh, a pancreatic cancer. And then through hybridization, we will be able to capture uh, the, ca the hybridization uh, through detection is a peak shift upon the finding. And we form a sequence um, of detection mechanism uh, using this platform to detect uh, the circulating DNA. And that formed the uh, basis for a recent company we founded before the pandemic in Boston called Nanopass DX. So uh, this is, we have an early funding from Y Combinator from Silicon Valley. And this is uh, a company dedicated for CTDNA detection. And uh, since the pandemic, the direction for the company is steer away from cancer a little bit, but not infectious disease, but also in the women health. Because two founders are, are uh, two female students and graduate from my lab. And based on that work, um, so Tim Polinski was a, a student <coughs> in my lab. He graduated um, a year and a half ago, worked for NASA, and now in, in Honeywell. So he looked into this biomarker detection uh, platform, but looked into the low temperature uh, scenario, because in outer space, uh, this will be quite interesting to look into the trace for life, right? Like any biomarkers and DNA uh, in the low temperature. So he take that technology and uh, explore into the low temperature detection uh, uh, scenario. And, um, and, uh, and we, we have a, a quite a few uh, grants awarded by, uh, by DAPA and then look into this specific application. And we have uh, some of the recent results um, from this detection. And we look into, uh, for example, the target biomolecule 16S RNA. And we have also a new design in terms of plasmonic signal uh, readout. And the team's expertise is on the optical surface patterning and design. So uh, we have a, a quite a high sensitivity uh, platform for low temperature biosensing. So in this work, you look at, we have designed a microfluidic chip for the liquid biopsy uh, on chip. And uh, we also demonstrate there are really multifunctional tool, right? Like we start out, we talk about nanomaterial synthesis, we talk about the, the chip design and also the detection company, uh, detection mechanism. And in terms of biology, capture the few rare biomarkers is only the beginning step, right? And what is really exciting is based on that few biomarkers, we can perform lots of things, like single cell profiling, I just highlight a few cases for you. And then um, for, uh, Circulating DNA exosomes. I think for exosomes, there are lots of opportunities over there as well. And in terms of applications that can go way beyond cancer, looking to other type of major diseases. Um, and here is really provide lots of data based on the platform we have. And um, 
the most recent, uh, another direction will be for advanced bio manufacturing. So if we can screen uh, the cells, the target cells, if that cells have the possibility to generate another cell, another uh, tissue, then we have capability to screen those cells, for example, the proretin uh, stem cells, and we can do reprogramming and then make uh, artificial, uh, artificial tissue uh, for, for new applications. So this is one um, example in the, in the liquid biopsy case where you see that the microfluidic devices, we design that platform uh, combined with immunology and molecular biology, we can select a uh, target biomarkers. I want to switch the direction a little bit uh, and talk about uh, another area which we can see uh, lots of micro device innovation and applications. So this is in the uh, energy uh, consideration, the energy segments. So in this area, uh, we start to look at the question of, you know, for energy supply for medical devices, right? There are quite a number of implantable medical devices if you look into the market right now. And deep brain stimulators, uh, retina implants, the big ones are cardiac devices, you know, cardiac pacemaker defibrillators, and which occupy 40% of implantable medical devices. Right? Other than that, they have for insulin pump and so forth. So the problem there is they all run on battery. I shouldn't say it's a problem, you know, it's a potential problem in a way the battery has its own lifetime, right? And given the patient who get these implants now tend to be younger and younger from time to time. We get people in the 30s and 40s to get to have a cardiac pacemaker. Well, the pacemaker need to be replaced every, every five to seven, eight years, which will be hopefully in many cases, which is also true, much shorter than the patient lifetime, right? So every surgery just replace the battery or create additional risk. It's no win-win situation for everyone, right? The insurance company do pay more as well. And when we analyze this scenario, it turns out that we need in terms of for the implantable market, whether we need to come up with uh, a solution for sustainable energy. And if you look over the human body, so we have a lot of motion for human body, right? There are, you know, natural motion like running, walking and jogging. There are also, you know, heart is beating, there are organ motion as well. So one lot, I'm not saying this is the only option, but one lot is how about harvesting the motion from the human body. And that way we can convert that mechanical energy into electricity, right? This is only one lot. We also can look into other type of flow and then, you know, biochemical properties, human food, how that can be converted into electricity. But here we're looking for motion as one of the promising options to provide energy. And we start this project back in 2008, so that about 10 plus years ago. And when, I, when we start this, um, we have a fantastic collaborator, Mark Fagman. So he's a cardiologist. And we look into the cardiac pacemaker specifically, you know, look into that one scenario, how the battery can be replaced. I don't know how much you know about a cardiac pacemaker. Essentially, it's a small computer, which you, you know, put under the collarbone. And there was a lead, right? The lead is go all the way to the ventricle and then provide the electrical pulse if needed. Right. And it's a lead-based pacemaker. In the recent time, there are also lead-less pacemaker, which is like a bullet from Metronics and Abbott is coming up uh, you know, last month. It's essentially going into the tissue. It's a small bullet type with 60% of volume occupied by battery. Right. Whenever it's a send something wrong, it provides a, a pulse right there. So I asked the doctor, how about the battery running out? Uh, how will you retrieve it? And I was told you don't retrieve it, you leave it there. So maybe one patient will get a multiple, you know, this lead as pacemaker over the lifetime. So that's a that, that's for later. But for now, for lead for lead based pacemaker, right? The lead right now is pretty passive device. There's a wire going through it, just like a wire providing the electrical current. Can we do something for the lead? Make it a multifunctional, make it an interesting device which can generate enough power, right? So that's hypothesis we have. So luckily we got a sponsorship from NIH because the idea was too crazy at that time. No institute wanted to fund it. So NIH director take it and say, okay, we're gonna give you money for transformative research because it's so crazy, so risky, we don't know whether it will succeed or not. So we got a five years funding. I'm gonna show you some of the work we have done over the past few years um, in 
in this space. So how do you convert energy from heartbeat based on the cardiac pacemaker platform and provide energy to the cardiac pacemaker? So here is the, I believe this is the video as well. This is actually uh, the pacemaker lead. And you will see that from that X-ray image, there was quite a bit of motion. So this is the lead securing the tissue. As the heart is beating, the lead is, is moving, the rather moving, but hopefully we can convert some of the motion here into electricity. And we approach this problem to from two different area, two different uh, uh, directions. One is, you know, we look at the, the material which can convert the mechanical motion into uh, electricity. Uh, which the piezoelectric material coming to mind. But the piezo has traditionally some of the problems in terms of well compatibility, in terms of conversion efficiency and others, right? Another direction is how could we structure the device geometry uh, in a way of make it to be a structure which can better harvest the motion, right? And with the advancement of, of all the soft material and the solid mechanics design, we actually have lots of possibilities there. So in terms of the, uh, the pure electric material design, uh, very quickly, our group come up with a way of designing a porous, metal porous PVDF material. And uh, by create, by using, uh, we're essentially using the, the vapor uh, invasion techniques uh, and then creating this pore structure, which increase energy uh, density. The second benefit for those pores is that you can embed other piezo ceramics, which has a high conversion efficiency, and, and then uh, incorporate you know, materials like multi-wall carbon nanotube, which enhance the beta phase. So beta phase in piezo material will provide a better conversion efficiency. So I will show you some of the results here. And this is a comparison of the PVDF we synthesized with other type of uh, piezo ceramics. You can see they have different the mechanical properties. They have different uh, uh, conversion efficiencies. But the basic idea is we want to have a higher energy density, while in the meantime, open the door for hybrid materials, incorporating um, high piezoelectric conversion ceramics, and then waste materials, which enhance beta waves. And we measured their uh, performance of different uh, porous materials uh, these are some of the uh, SEM pictures showing the structure. And we can make some of the composite material. So here you show that we have the multi-wall carbon nanotube embedded into the metal parts material, which enhance the beta phase, provide a better uh, piezoelectric conversion efficiency. And we can also incorporate the zinc oxide. You know, zinc oxide is a piezo material as well with a higher uh, these three three conversion efficiency, so enhance overall the device the, the material performance. In terms of device design, we have multiple device designs. So this is a helical structure, and uh, which can wrap around a, a lead structure like pacemaker lead and provide a better energy conversion. And this is the setup before we try and through the animal models. Uh, based on the shaker. So the shaker provides control the motion, which we can measure uh, the electrical output based on specific uh, mode of the motion. And we studied uh, various uh, experimental conditions, you know, in the uh, buffer solutions uh, in, in a different uh, number of layers of materials and how that impact the, the energy output. So these are a couple of videos which we can uh, play uh, both of the videos. When we have the device code around a silicon tube, and we can see, uh, we can benchmark uh, the voltage output from this device. And for the bottom one, there's also a video. It's a power uh, LED, it's a power LED. So our goal is we try to come up with a device which can provide 30 microwatts uh, and upper the power, and that way we can I supply a regular pacemaker for the year, year time frame. And based on that uh, measure powers PVDF material, we have various type of geometry design. So very quickly, here is showing, um, we have a helical design wrapped around um, the pacemaker leads, and we demonstrate 
they have quite a, quite a remarkable uh, energy output. So this is for the in vivo sensing uh, re results because this material, this material, the PVDF, can provide energy harvesting but can also provide pressure sensing uh, functionalities. We try this design into an animal model. So this is in collaboration with uh, UT San Antonio uh, Medical School. We tried on a kind of model. We have uh, approved the IRB to uh, follow the, the, the protocol here, you know, generating the mesoporous PVDF material in multi-layer. Here we tried the four layers and six layers, and we uh, anchor them into different locations in the heart for the big model. And then we can modulate the heart motion using a different drug and then measure you know, that drug effect on how much energy we can, we can convert into, uh, into, uh, into electricity. And we try it on light up an LED and we try to charge a micro battery. Uh, we also try the stability of the performance over the long term. And we try uh, that animal move and whether that will make any uh, impact on the energy harvesting. So this couple of videos shows some of the procedure we tried on, on the pig model. So on the on the right up on the top right, there was a, a recording uh, as we tried the experiments about you know the the high the electrophysiology signal and the ECG, the pressure signal and the ECG. And we studied various effects. So here we tried on the uh, pacing effects, uh, we tried it on the cardiac uh, counter uh, contractility effect. And for both cases, we're using the uh, mesoporous PVD uh, with um, uh, the, the helical design. And we anchor them into different points and try to identify the best location, which we anchor the tip of the lead, and then which give us a maximum energy. And we also studied how many layers of those PVDF need to be wrapped around. And uh, it, in this case, it's a combination between, you know, not more layers better, but really make sure a combination of mechanical properties is soft enough, can be conformal to the leads, but at the same time still provide enough energy. So this is ongoing work and shows that for the lead-based pacemaker, we can convert the lead into an active lead, and not only for energy harvesting, but also provide the pressure uh, sensing capabilities. Uh, this is not only the uh, geometry we designed, we also designed some other geometry. So in this case, it's called a multi-beam structure, where the multi-beam is a wrap around the lead, uh, where we can put them into uh, doing the same procedure as you put the regular a lead-based cardiac pacemaker, and then measure the energy output from it. And in another paper, we try to use so-called karagami design. So if you ever play the, the paper, uh, uh, when, when you were a child, you can make a different card for the paper and then stretch them into a different shape. So we can do the same for the PVDF material. And then by going through the karagami design, we achieve flexibility, conformability, and make it really stretchable. And we also tried this as one of the uh, design for the lead-based energy harvester. And here you see there are different characterization. We also tried this in animal model and measured the energy conversion under different heartbeat. And finally, here is another a geometry we call a cantilever design. So this cantilever design is uh, wrapped around it's, you can think about as a one and fixed cantilever, but with multiple cantilevers uh, in the concentric arrangement. And uh, here we introduce a concept about the biostability. So they can, the cantilever can switch one from one state to another state during the conversion, during the transition, uh, they can achieve the effect like a mechanical amplifier to produce more electrical energy. So in this uh, helical design, uh, we really have uh, lots of flexibility uh, and we can do some of the very interesting solid mechanics analysis about the way we can make that helical structures with different uh, tuning angle and then combine with the material properties, enhance the beta phase with, for better piezoelectric conversion. 
uh, to design optimize the energy harvest. And we can compare this various design, and then you know, this provides a lot of uh, design possibilities uh, for for offering uh, optimize the energy output from uh, this material, this geometry. So for everyone in this work, we have uh, uh, some highlights from the community. So clearly, there are some interests out there uh, in terms of going this direction. You know, combining mechanical uh, motion for electricity conversion going through piezoelectric effect. And then the solid mechanics design about device structure, which provide the better energy harvest. This video we, we showed earlier. So as a quick summary for this part, um, we talk about using this small scale device, soft polymers, and then a solid mechanic design combination of which provide uh, a, a very useful, interesting way of harvesting energy to sustain implantable medical devices. And we cover the material design in the top left. Uh, this is based on Mesopars PVDF, but there are, I think there are other different composites. You know, the way we create a porous material is because it provides a substrate which can incorporate further other devices to uh, enhance the performance. Uh, we also have fundamental studies about uh, this is essentially you can think about it as a resonator, right? The heart is a low frequency system. So how do you come up with a low resonant system which can harvest the heart motion and better can do, convert it to electricity? In a, in a recent time, we also look into another uh, area which is go beyond any harvest. You know, if you put this device <coughs> into a surface, uh, that will provide sensing capabilities, but also provide haptic. Uh, uh, the haptic sensing capabilities. When they combine with you know, data science, that can provide some of the interesting uh, application. So for the remaining few minutes, I want to talk about applying the same set of material uh, with a little different device design for another application. So you notice I put a logo there. You know, that was a company well known for, for a long time, but they just changed the name the recent time. And we had a collaboration for about a year. Uh, that was before, I think a year, a year before the pandemic, on about the flexible haptic transducers. At that time, I had no idea about what matter metaverse is, right? But then now you can see that um, with that additional capability for internet, uh, we can convert a touch over the internet that can create a lot of other user cases. So for flexible haptic transducers, the idea here is we want to create that time the project is called Inertem. We want to put a device on, uh, on the arm, on the wrist, on the human body, and that way you can convey the touch or sense the touch. And I did some literature before I talked to uh, a few doctors. It turns out using skin as a hearing device is not new. I mean, it's back in the 60s, people began to look at whether you can hear through the skin, not only through the ear. But they studied the property of a skin, it turns out to be skin is not a perfect hearing device. It is not that sensitive. It's not really suitable for, for hearing. So when we design uh, this, this device, we need to consider the frequency response of the skin and then the sensitivity for the skin, right? The skin at different frequency, it can give a very different feeling uh, for, 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 for the people. So anyway, this is only beginning point for that study. And our goal here is come up with very thin, very light, and a, a versatile device which generates a touch under different frequency. And you probably still remember PVDF I talked about a few minutes ago when we use that to code the surface for the and generating energy from the hot motion. And here we you know still play around between the mechanical domain and electrical domain and try to generate the touch right when you apply a voltage on it. And hopefully at a certain frequency that will give a feeling of touch, scratching and other type of you know, motion which people can sense about. And here we have different cut for, for the device. It's called a karagami actuator, and it was different shape and under different uh, electrical field uh, actuation that can generate different type of squeezing, right? And then, you know, uh, scratching and, and all the different uh, uh, mechanical motion and create the happy sense. <clears throat> and you may say, well, we have, some of the devices available in the market, 
But if you look into uh, these devices, it's really relatively bulky. And then they are not that thing as a small format as you would like them to be, like provided by regular mechanical server motors that tend to be bulky and heavy. So our goal is come up with ideal haptic transducers, which is a fast and flexible, high force and reconfigurable, and with advantages in the speed, in the force, flexibility, and reconfigurability. And one example we showed is based on this design where we name it as a, you know, it's almost like a, a, a FED structure, a flexible electronic, uh, electrostatic uh, actuator, uh, flexible electrostatic transducer. Uh, it's, uh, it's also a, a FET, where the basic principle is a capacitor. When you apply a voltage on these multi-layer structures, it will generate a tapping motion. I, I think this one uh, is this one, the next one is, uh, oh, here, here is a video. So if you click on the left hand. So when you apply a voltage, you can see it's quite a visible uh, motion. And we have an RV which you can flip this around and put it on the arm. Uh, you can measure uh, the, the, the touch, the haptic performance under different frequencies. And when you put on the wrist and you can measure different motion for the hands, right? So this also created a, a, some of the very interesting scenario uh, for, for application. Okay, so I think I covered quite some areas here. So I, I talk about uh, the micro nanoscale engineering, I talk about the material structures, and the combination of the both, you can use them for biomarker screening, you can use them for energy harvesting, you can convert it to variable devices. So it's a very diverse area, but I think once you have the power of doing uh, material design, have a way to miniaturize them, integrate them onto the chip format, that can do great things for medicine. And this is ongoing dialogue, I think, ongoing collaboration between engineers and uh, the medical doctors, clinicians. Uh, that's exactly the beauty and potential for BF. So I think that's about uh, the last slide I have. Uh, I want to show you that this is one chart I put together a while ago, uh, which I believe still provide the same excitement to me every day, where you see that as engineer, we see many advancements. Um, and then we combine uh, with you know, the knowledge about the medicine where you talk to collaborate with your uh, medical collaborators, you see there are lots of synergy, lots of possibilities for collaboration. I only show you a few examples here, but the possibilities are uh, unlimited. And I want to end with uh, thanks for my group. So among this group, uh, now there are many students and researchers are running their own group right now. And we also have a few entrepreneurs I'm Olga uh, Tedimody Addison now running a company in Boston. And then I have Andrew Clausen, and then Billy is launching a company on Pulse Flex for variable applications. Um, um, so I think, end of the day, you know, in my position, I think in my colleagues' position, the research is part of the game, but really see the people carry this forward uh, to create, you know, good future. And I thank my funding agencies over the time. And uh, I want to conclude by thanking you uh, for being here. I know it's a, it's a quick talk for many things, but I hope this open more doors rather than make you know, a one or two few conclusions. I think the future is unlimited. Thank you, and I want to enjoy the research. Paper. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank you, Dr. Join and, and continue with the program, including the QA. And uh, he may have uh, a lot of information for you how this is going to happen during the day. Okay. Thanks, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, you. Yeah. Welcome, everybody, uh, for graduate research day. And of course, um, next up, we have the poster session at 10 30. So we have a mini break now. And but before we get to that, of course, we want to ask Dr. Zhang if you have any questions. So open up for questions. I'll start. Uh, sure. That's really cool stuff. Huh?
you touched a bit on the, um, I think, the sensing of the piezo-based uh, harvesting in the pacemaker application. Right, right. I'm wondering what kind of what kind of information you're trying to get out. Is it just rhythm? Is it also tractile force? What can you back out from, from those uh, studies? Yeah, so that sensor was designed as an energy harvester to begin with. So we try to, first of all, understand mechanical motion for the heart and then convert the heart motion to the plasma state. But you are right in a way of uh, through talking to the clinician, I think converting to electricity is one big step. But then what is really triggering, exciting for them is providing sensor data. Once you have that extra power, you enable lots of possibilities to have extra power. And you create a closed loop system, perhaps. Exactly. And then one, I think, important insight I learned from the clinician is there are many sites which you can only access very few times. When they open the heart, when they do open heart surgery, there are only places they can only access once. But right now, there was wasted because there was not my device you can put in. And uh, when you have actual power, you can put in a device there, and then I can provide the data for, for the future uh, prevention diagnosis. There was one company called CardioMAMS. I don't know if you heard about that. Uh, so Mark Allen found that company. But CardioMAMS end of the day is a passive device. It's a small pressure sensor. It's a passive device. It caused a battery. There was no battery to support it. So when, when you put one of these uh, transducers there, at, at the end of the day, you're, you, you're converting energy from the motion to electricity in this case. Um, don't you think that there, that there is cell system as a response to those changes? Any stress or resistance that may, may reconfigure uh, by nerve configuration? Or what do you think? I may have a long term uh, impact somehow on, on the system. Let's say if you put a if you put inside a, a, a battery, right? Something that converts flow flow into physics at the end that we is the system somehow like so yeah. it's, it's yeah. producing a system, right? And maybe reducing a little bit the flow in general. There may be sense sensor. Teria uh, or that detect this and so how try to repair. I'm just trying to think in a in sure. an example, but I sure, sure, sure. That, that, I think that's a really great question. I, 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 I'm thinking along that line, I think about two different possible to interpret your question, right? So one is once you have an actual burden on the heart, that might probe that might form a, a new feedback loop which can impact the heart itself. The second is when you put the, the device into that location already, you can create extra sensing capabilities, right? So for the first direction, I think um, right now, because for the lead based as how they face maker, all the add on on the lead itself, and on the, the lead is initially from the environment. So the impact for the current procedure is minimal. Now we are now working on for the second direction, which uh, second project, which is looking for the lead last face maker. It's more challenging, but Industry is uh, very, very excited about whether someone can figure out energy harvesting supply for the lead, lead last phase maker. Right. So the, the first question is we try to keep it a low profile, minimal interaction for even the, the, the delivery procedure for the cardiac phase maker. Everything is unchanged, just making the lead be multifunctional and the energy harvesting. The second direction, which I think came from your question, is really is add on the sensing capabilities with this new energy harvesting possibility. I think that part that possibility is very real because right now the cardiovascular system essentially unchanged for the past few decades. I mean that the energy limitation is right there. Yeah, in the early 50s people using mercury battery and now to the DM, the lithium ion battery. Lithium ion battery is great. But then the energy density increase for batteries began to saturate. You won't see this exponential growth over the time. So I think at this point, the energy supply is a real problem. It's not only for you know the greenhouse, but for the EV and for healthcare, let's say, how you solve energy harvest. So I think this is one initiative we're very, very excited about. There's a question online from Dr. Raj. I guess actually he has three questions, but okay. just to read it out. Okay. For harvesting, is the piezo film pulled? Yes. What area is needed for 30 microwatts? Are electrodes parallel plate or interdigitated? 
Very good question. The number question, the first one is yes. The piezo film is full. It's pulled. It is. it is pulled. Yeah. The second question: What area is needed for 30 microwatts? That's a super good question. So right now, if, I think you pay attention to the table I, I just did. Right now, the single layer I give you about you know eight microwatts, right? So 30 microwatts is a holy grail number. I heard from my study studying me all the time. 30 microwatts, 30 microwatts. So you can do number one. You can do multi-layer. You don't necessarily to step over the area to multi-layer. The second is you can really give different device design category. I mean, one kind of will give you like eight points. You can you can wrap around with uh, eight or ten uh, kind of levers to scale it up. Uh, so I think that's the second question. I just give a quick answer here. There are lots of ways to scale up, and then electrodes power power play up interdigitated. I think the simple answer is parallel play. It's like a capacity, uh, and uh, I think what uh, this. Uh, what uh, this uh, it meant by uh, it is we can create a cascading of the capacitors, which is another possibility. But right now, it's considered to be a, a huge number of case. I have a question about your uh, circulating tumor cell technology. Um, sure. So the chip, uh, so I guess, uh, how much blood sample would you need to acquire from? Your patients and how fast is the test? Right, right. That's a great question. So when we start, we try to benchmark with the current Veridex system, right? So it's about a six scale, uh, six milliliter. Uh, what we find out is by doing microchip design, small scale, you can actually cut that by half. So you can do three to four. You know. The screen itself is very fast. So based on the, you have a micro foodie chip, you have a pump, you can tune the pump. So they can screen you know, in minutes. Uh, and then for detection, I think the time consuming part is the fixation of the captured cancer cell, fluorescent labeling, and then the fluorescent imaging. So that part is quite a email chemistry. But capture is accelerated. And the other question is related to problem cancer biology. So, so, so I guess a primary cancer is not going to produce CTC until they are getting ready to test the size. So I guess at what stage cancer, or primary cancer is going to produce CTCs and um, would that be a good biomarker for early diagnosis? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. That was debate, that's a debatable topic for cancer biologists, right? I'm not as biologist, but I talked to a lot of them. I think the question early days when we look at CTC for early diagnosis, right? And it's debatable whether at which stage, whether it's very late stage they begin to see CTC. Some cancer biologists say it's happen very early on. They can begin to shed the uh, uh, cancer cell called a cancer stem cell, uh, CSC. So that cancer stem cell was shed very early on in the circulation, right? So I, I think that's the whole spectrum. I mean, there are arguments about the scan early and spread out later. But anyway, it's provide a venue for doing big develops. You don't have to cut. You just draw the blood, and draw blood can be done, you know, in a low resource setting that right? you don't have to go to a fancy hospital. So that's number one. Number two is, I think now the user case for CDC for biomarker screening is probably not only not very much for diagnosis, but rather for therapy. If you know the cancer, the patient has a cancer, right? You just have to do treatment, like a chemo, video, and how do you benchmark the efficacy, efficacy of the treatment? And you, you draw bone marrow, which is painful. You do biopsy, which is painful, invasive. But blood draw from time to time is OK. And then you draw a small amount of blood, you tell whether the therapeutic effects is there or not. Right. So I think that the shift is a little bit from early diagnosis to traffic therapy. And I know all machine was used for that purpose. I mean, they, they just draw the blood, they run a report, and tell the patient, tell the doctor, saying, hey, the treatment is effective or not. You should really tune the time based on the detection results. So that's, I think that's a very strong, that's a stronger case than early diagnosis. And anyway, I mean, people don't want to know they have a cancer, right? So I think the target therapy is, you know, more or less it's more, more usable in the case. And you talked about uh, cell secretion such as exosomes. Uh, can we elaborate a bit on that uh, in terms of uh, is that more for diagnosis or is that for treatment? Yes, that's. Uh, I think exosome. I have relatively, you know, 
we don't have published work on that. We just looked at that open space as a possibility. Well, actually, some you know uh, earlier people talk about uh, vesicles, you know, small vesicles, whether they have microRNA that's meaningful as a biomarker or not. Um, and a few years ago, there was a little tension on that, but I, I see people putting more attention to vesicle cell vesicle and exosome in the recent time because they find the correlation between exosome and sample region disease. So that's an area I think is still ongoing, and I'm still learning as well. You know, the CTC screening, CTDNA, they would have some sort of work. But just, um, if you have, you know, expertise and expert on that, I'd love to talk to them. But maybe our platform can be applicable there once we have a clear biomarker to recognize. Any other questions for Dr. Zach? Well, let's thank him once again.